Here we go. Hello, members. Welcome. Good evening. Recording. Oh, we've got lots of members joining. Now we uh, have muted everyone. So, uh, what's that? Writing course. Hello. Don't worry. We're just letting everyone in and popping you all on mute. But welcome. Hello, I'm seeing some familiar faces, some new faces. It's very exciting for me. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Coming in thick and fast now, which is fantastic. So hoping that you can hear me. Those of you I can see, a thumbs up if you can hear me, please. Oh, hearing some other people as they arrive as well. Apologies about that. Oh, we've had a little um, small technical glitch to begin with, but as you all flood in to learn about Pinot Noir, then we will, fingers crossed, be able to get going in just a second. So uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Anna Spooner, and for those of you who don't know, I am a tastings and events coordinator here at the Wine Society. Um, welcome. A huge welcome to all of you. This is the first of what we hope will be a long-standing series that we've decided to call Sip Size. Uh, some may say clever pun on words, other may say a little bit lazy, but we don't mind. Uh, designed to be similar to bite-sized chunks, 45 minutes, usually three wines, but a little bit of theory as well. And they are all designed to help you get the most enjoyment out of wine. Uh, they are going to be building blocks. So this is an introduction to Pinot Noir. Uh, I'll go on to that in a moment. Uh, but rest assured, we will be building to some more advanced building blocks as well. Um, but we do recommend um, if you're new to wine and beginning your journey, then the introductions are a great place to start. Uh, but there will be lots of other sort of ranges that are already available on the website for all levels of, of learning and enjoyment. So uh, I should do a small disclaimer about Zoom before we get going. I'm delighted I can see so many of your lovely faces, a hundred of you to be exact, which is wonderful. Um, now, a word of warning, we're streaming to YouTube. The streaming will only be showing speak of you. So the video that's recorded to YouTube will currently only be my face. There may be opportunity later on for you to unmute, but if you do unmute, word of warning, you will be recorded onto our YouTube channel. So uh, without further ado, bear with me just a second. We have one small other technical glitch. Uh, if you just bear with me a moment. Uh, we are having trouble letting people in, but I'm hoping that Tim and Catherine behind the scenes are going to be able to admit those people, fingers crossed. It says our meeting has reached capacity, which it shouldn't have done, um, but don't worry. Uh, Tim is going to quickly introduce you to uh, how to use Zoom, and I'm going to sort out the meeting request. And Tim, over to you on how to use Zoom, and hopefully, fingers crossed as well, a little poll, which uh, our attendees should be able to let us know where they are and what they're drinking. So, uh, Tim, over to you if you're there. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. Um, so, as Anna said, she's just going to quickly sort out a technical issue. Uh, but in, in the meantime, for those that aren't familiar with Zoom, uh, hopefully most of you are, uh, throughout the night, we'd love to see your comments in the chat section. Uh, so, please do, do use that. If you have any technical issues or any questions specifically for Anna or the Tastings team, you can direct message uh, by changing the address button to just uh, either the Tastings team, which is myself, or Tastings team two, which is Catherine, or to Anna Spooner directly. Uh, as, as you can see, there is a poll that we'd love to see uh, which wines you're, uh, you're uh, having tonight. Uh, we have selected three particular wines that Anna will be discussing in a little bit of detail. Uh, we have the Kumu Village Hand Harvest Pinot from uh, New Zealand. We then have a wine from Burgundy and a wine from uh, Sonoma as well. 
Uh, these wines are more to be indicative of, of the styles that Anna will be discussing. We're not going into too much technical detail with individual wines, and that's going to be something we, we repeat throughout the series. The wines are really just a, a vehicle and a, a sounding board to, to start conversation. There's no expectation, no obligation to, to purchase those wines and to taste them. Uh, but hopefully, if you are tasting along, that you find that they do help in, uh, add to your experience uh, as you as you do um, do join join the events. Uh, Anna will be leading most of the events throughout the series. Uh, they will be covering, as Anna said, different different levels. We'll be going into some quite technical, geeky deep dives into certain topics. And Anna's well placed to to really cover all bases. She's a great communicator. She's recently uh, passed her diploma. Uh, both uh, passing our exams and just recently she's been admitted into the Master of Wine program. So we're very proud of her progress uh, and we wish her well on, on that journey into the, the deep, uh, dark depths of the Master of Wine program. Uh, the other thing I should note uh, with Anna is that she's currently in the Southern Rhone, uh, where she's also uh, furthering her, her wine experience uh, by uh, assisting with Harvest this year uh, at um, yeah, I've been winery in the Southern Rhone. So yeah, she's uh, zooming in uh, from, from the South of France and hopefully that uh, will only add to her, her knowledge and experience. And we do have some Southern Rhone events coming up uh, utilizing her when she's uh, there locally. Now I see that she's popping back on. So hopefully that uh, means that she's good to go. Just on you. Oh, yep. Yeah, sorry. I have popped back on. Um, I am struggling just at the moment to get the other members into the room, but I'm hoping to be able to do that very shortly. Uh, but I can kick off anyway whilst I'm doing it and give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, Pinot Noir is one of the oldest great varieties in the world. Um, now, they do believe that Pinot Noir is actually around two millennia old. Uh, I can't say that I am a scientist that can that can understand how on earth they, they know that. But what we do know about Pinot Noir is the first recorded evidence using the name Pinot Noir is in 1395. So that is one of the oldest grape varieties in the world. Now, what does that mean? Well, that actually means that uh, lots of things and, and developments have happened with the Pinot Noir grape variety. So uh, one particular thing is that it's got lots and lots of children. And what you might not know is that Pinot Noir is actually the parent of Chardonnay and Gamay, and also another white grape variety from Burgundy called Allegote. So there are plenty of little children that come from Pinot Noir. Uh, it's old enough to have those offspring. Uh, it's also old enough to have many different clones. And by clones, we mean that there have been slight variations in the grape, uh, a little bit like growing uh, different species of roses. So a rose is a rose, but you can have lots and lots of different kinds of rose. Um, and to put it in perspective, there are around 50 types of uh, Pinot Noir clone that are commercially grown, although UC Davies says that there are 200 that they're currently working with. And all these clones give slightly different, um, slightly different variations. So some will be good in cooler climates, some good in warmer, some give more red fruits, some give more black fruits, and they're just slight tweaks to the, uh, to the Pinot Noir grape variety itself. Now, that's not to be confused with its morphing because Pinot Noir has also actually mutated. So the lovely red grape that we're used to seeing here, Pinot Noir, has actually also um, mutated and become Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris as well. So they're the ones that you're probably more familiar with. Um, in terms of the uh, the character of Pinot, I'm going to quickly, if my technology allows me, show you a little bit. And this is where I'm going to ask you members to do a bit of homework, because it does not matter what Pinot Noir or which Pinot Noir, I should say, that you have this evening. Here are some flavours and aromas that you can find amongst the Pinot Noir grape variety. 
Now that top cluster that you'll see there, uh, those fruits and flowers, I will go through them, but those are the things that tend to be naturally occurring in the grape variety. So those are things like violets, we've got some raspberry, strawberry, uh, the cooler climates tend to give those red fruits, cranberry, uh, and I'm gonna go onto that in just a second when we do start tasting, because I think that's one of the most obvious ones here. Um, red cherry as well. Um, then when we go on to slightly warmer climates or different clones, as I mentioned, you get things like uh, black cherry and black plum. Uh, in particular, uh, I think we're going to find some of those on wine number two tonight, which is going to be the burgundy. But don't worry, we'll come back to that when we revisit it. On the other side of your screen to the fruits, you should see some spices. Um, now, the spices are usually, not exclusively, but usually from oak. So we're seeing things like uh, some smoke. So that's that slightly unusual image that you've got there. Um, there's also um, some cloves, some cinnamon. I also often on Pinot Noir get Chinese five spice. So uh, that can be a, a, a great thing to look out for. And vanilla there. Um, again, the, the final wines had a little bit more, um, shall we say, oak influence or certainly new oak influence. And you should be able to spot a little bit of some of those things on that final wine. Uh, now, last but not least, the bottom cluster. Uh, bottom cluster are usually flavours that we get from um, age in Pinot Noir. So mushrooms, a bit of earth. I've even got some truffles there because truffles can be a really prominent and prevalent smell in old Pinot. Now, one thing I love about old Pinot as well that I haven't put on here because it's not quite as, um, shall we say, common, but I often get smoky bacon or streaky bacon. And if you're lucky enough to have had an old Burgundy, uh, you may have smelt that sort of meaty aroma that is absolutely sort of ethereal and fascinating. So what I'd like you to do, I'm going to go get straight into a bit of tasting. And like I said, a bit of homework. I'd like you to any of the Pinots you have. But if you're following along with me, I would particularly like you to try it with our Kumu. So our village Pinot Noir. I'm going to talk more specifically about it shortly. But the Kumu Village, I would say, out of the three wines I recommended, is the most unadulterated version of Pinot Noir. So I'm going to leave the screen on and I'm going to allow you a little bit of time to see if you can pick any of those up in your glass. I'm hoping you should be able to get mainly fruit because, as I mentioned, this is quite unadulterated. So write in the chat if you're getting any of those red fruits. I think for me particularly, uh, I get that cranberry, sort of very, very crunchy red cherry, crunchy raspberry. Certainly not, um, not overripe fruits here. There's definitely a light fruit flavor or right, light fruit aroma, I should say. Um, and... Now let's talk about the structure of Pinot, because I think that's really important. Um, I will allow you a moment to digest the aromas. And I'm going to take this down, but please do, as I said, if you've got a pen and pencil, you can write it down. But if not, uh, fear not, it's not an exam paper here. It's just a bit of fun. Um, but in terms of the structure of Pinot, so what are we looking for? Um, what we're really looking for here is uh, the, the classic characters of Pinot Noir. Now, if you have got the Kumu, and I have it here to try and show members who don't, it is so pale. It's a really, really pale skinned grape variety. It's, um, it's practically water-like. It looks a bit like Ribena almost, it's so, so pale. But basically, one of the reasons that Pinot is so, so light in colour, sometimes we'll prove that theory wrong shortly, but the skins of the grape variety are very um, light and they're thin. 
So what that means is that there are less anthocyanins and there are less color pigments than, say, a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Shiraz or a Syrah would have. Um, and there are also the other thing that occurs in the skin of the grape is the tannins. Now, in its purest form, Pinot Noir tends to be a lighter tanninned wine. Now, tannins, for those unaware, it's that drying sensation. It can be in the teeth, it can be in the gums, the lips, the tongue even. So when you taste a Pinot, don't expect to sort of have to chew it. Um, you're, you will tend to get a lighter bodied because those tannins are light and high acid wine. Your mouth should water when you have a Pinot Noir. So uh, let's give it a go. I'm going to taste along with you, which is why we've done this in meeting format so you can see your fellow tasters. So if you've had a sniff, you've had a look at some of those characters. Let's go for a taste. Kumu River is a great wine to start with because it's doing all of those things that hopefully you agree I've just shared with you. I can't talk to you because my mouth's watering so much. It's packed with acidity, really refreshing. The tannins, I can feel them just on the roof of my mouth, a slight drying sensation, but definitely not too, um, too drying or too big. Light in body and lovely cherry fruits. Um, cherry, cranberry, raspberry, lots and lots of red. Um, almost a slightly herbaceous note, but um, certainly very aromatic, enjoyable, pleasant. Um, so those are the things we would look for in a Pinot. That sort of um, light to medium body, high acidity, the lower end of tannins, but that's just when you haven't fiddled around with the grape too much. And like I mentioned, if you again haven't fiddled around with it too much, those pale skins. So let me know what you think. Uh, I've seen a few of you not spitting, quite right too. If I wasn't having to go back to the Vendage and sort through Syrah grapes first thing early doors as the sun rises tomorrow, I think I'd probably be doing the same as Pinot Noir is most definitely my favourite red grape variety. Um, and as you're tasting that and getting used to Pinot, I'm just um, going to talk a little bit about why you would and wouldn't grow Pinot Noir because uh, hopefully some of you that are joining this evening are fans of Pinot and, and that would certainly be as I would expect if you're here um, but some of you may, may not be and would like to know a little bit more about the grape variety itself. So why would you not grow Pinot Noir? Let's start with that. Um, or why should, another way of phrasing it, why isn't the world growing Pinot Noir? Why is every Tom, Dick and Harry not producing world-class Pinot Noir? Um, well, it's actually really, really hard to grow. Um, it's, uh, some people call it the devil's grape. Um, some people sort of, winemakers say they love it and hate it at the same time. Uh, and there's really, really good reasons for that. First of all, it's a really limited climate. So there are only a few parts of the world that can produce decent Pinot Noir. And generally, that's because the um, climate has to be cool enough. When Pinot Noir is grown in a too warmer climate, so down here in the Southern Rhone would be utterly useless. Uh, when it's grown in a, uh, in a climate where it's too warm, the fruit becomes incredibly simple. And actually, Pinot Noir loses all of its charm and its elegance. Um, when we grow Pinot as well at too high a yield, so uh, you know, if you wanted to grow on a big flat waterlogged plain in Chile, for example, um, the yield, so if they, you produce too much fruit, the Pinot Noir will taste flat and bland. And Toby Morale, our buyer for Burgundy, literally says it's like falling off a cliff. There is a point where Pinot Noir simply becomes uninteresting. So for those looking to make money out of wine uh, or making a commercially viable, affordable wine, say under £10, Pinot Noir is just not the grape for you. It doesn't produce enough fruit, so you can't make enough wine to, to make it viable. So those are the commercials. 
Um, but there's also other things about the grape itself. It's really disease prone. So it, it tends to catch all sorts of things, uh, which makes it a challenge. The other things that might also be a problem are those thin skins I was talking about. Um, they, can, they tend to get catch diseases through being burst or being punctured, not very nice. Um, and then also it's an early budding grape variety. And what that means for any keen gardeners who probably already know, but uh, the buds basically come out of the plant uh, earlier than other grape varieties, um, which sounds lovely. But what that means is when you're already growing it in a cool place and suddenly these buds come out, all your fruit uh, or your potential fruit is going to be at risk of getting damaged. So frost is a major, major problem with Pinot Noir. Let's be more positive. Why would you grow it? Um, oh, and I could, I could do four hours on why you would grow Pinot Noir, but I'll try and keep it to four minutes, shall I? Which might be a challenge. Um, many people say it's the most terroir reflective Grape variety, not necessarily all ball varieties, but certainly red. Uh, I think there's probably a few Nebbiolo producers uh, who would maybe fight me to that one. But it's definitely reflective of where it's grown. So winemakers love to grow it because it shows a sense of place. Um, it's also incredibly aromatic. And a lot of people use the word heady to describe Pinot Noir. And I think that's such an amazing word. But it's really this lovely mix of an elegant nose, um, but that can be so, so powerful. So it's a very interesting um, dichotomy of elegance and power all at the same time, and particularly on the nose. So you can take a glass of Pinot Noir before you've even tasted it. It's giving you an experience, which, which is obviously a lovely thing. And then lastly, it can age. Now I say can because not all Pinot Noirs are built to age. The Kumi River, for those of you who just enjoyed some, it's not a wine built to age. It's a young, fruity, drink it fresh wine. Um, but some Pinot Noirs can really withstand tests of time. And certainly not as long uh, lived as things like Cabernet Sauvignon, which tend to go forever, or, or some of the sweet wines of the world. But you're looking at Premier Cru's sort of reaching their peak only after you know, three, four years, um, but others giving eight, 10, even 20 years, some of the best Pinot Noir in the world. So there's lots and lots to enjoy about Pinot. It's not just um, a simple, a simple fact or a simple grape variety. There's plenty to get your teeth stuck into. So I think on that point, since we've tried the first wine, but we're going to go through all three of the wines and I'm conscious of time. So I think what's best to do is I'm going to be really sneaky and I am going to come back to France because Burgundy is the home of Pinot Noir. But I would actually like to start with our Kumi River in the new world. Um, so for anybody who is tasting along, I will tell you a little bit about the wine that you have just tasted. So Kumu River is um, in New Zealand, based in New Zealand, owned by Michael Brakovich, MW. And uh, this is a hand harvest Pinot from 2019. I should say that New Zealand only produces 1% of the world's wine, full stop, um, and a minute percentage of Pinot. However, the international reputation for Pinot Noir from New Zealand is enormous. So um, the most famous and recognizable, I'll just move on my slides. The most famous and recognizable is actually from Central Otago. Uh, and those Pinots tend to be thick skinned. Uh, there's a very low ozone layer there. Um, and so they have more tannins because those skins have had to sturdy up um, for that thin ozone layer. This particular wine comes from, and if my technology aids me, I will be able to show you. There we go. So I've got my laser pointer out, which is a new feature for me. So, um, But we've got Kumi Rivers based up in Auckland, but they've actually just bought a plot of land here in Hawke's Bay. And they acquired it in 2017. And the reason it's so good for Pinot is that it has this lovely cooling influence of the ocean and a sort of uh, windblown clay 
over limestone and Pinot Noir particularly likes clay over limestone. Some of you who are wine buffs may suggest that Hawke's Bay is good for other kinds of red wine too, and you would not be wrong, uh, but certainly the reputation for Pinot in Hawke's Bay on the cooler sites, I must stress those cooler sites, is really gaining momentum. So just to give you an idea, lots of lovely little vineyard plots all around the town of Hastings, and do shout members if you've been, because I'm planning my next travel adventure, so I'm keen to know top tips on where to go. Um, but this wine, I mentioned earlier, much lighter. What they've done to this wine is they've taken all of the stems off. Um, so they've just got the pure berries, they've crushed them, and then they fermented just for two weeks, which in the grand scheme of red wine is not the longest, but certainly not the shortest. And they've just pumped down very gently twice, twice a day by hand. So um, it hasn't had too much contact with the skin. So we have that gorgeous pale color. I hate doing this on a, on a webcam, it never works. But if you have it, you'll be able to see it. Um, it's been aged for seven months, but, and this is a big important, but this hasn't been aged in oak. It's been aged in a tank. So we're really seeing an expression of Pinot Noir at its very, very purest here. So let me know what you think of it. I've got the chat up on my other screen, so I'm keen to hear. Um, and I'll have a small pause whilst I see how you're all getting on. And then what I'm going to do is go back. And I know I was, was naughty, but I'm going to go back to France. And you will see why I skipped France and we went to uh, New Zealand first, because I went by tasting order and not by um, anthropology or geography. I went, went via what's going to taste best in what order. So, um, right, I think in which case I can tell you a little bit about Burgundy. So, bear with me, pardon me. Oh, I missed a photo, sorry. This is the, uh, the beautiful Hawke's Bay Vineyards. So, Yes, please do send recommendations. So let's go on to Burgundy. Now, if you're tasting along again this evening, uh, this wine is made by Nicolas, Nicolas Perrault. Uh, it is the 2018 vintage, and it's of a particular crew called Marin, Marange. I asked my French winemaker today how to say it. Marange. I got there in the end. Um, and it's a premier crew plot. I'll show you where in just a moment. But whilst I tell you a little bit about Burgundy, please do taste along because this is a markedly different wine. So a little bit about Burgundy itself. Uh, well, Burgundy runs down the central strip of France, uh, just towards the south. And um, for anybody who's ever driven the drive through the, sp the spine of, of France will know the area well. You literally drive through the vineyards. Um, it is a region that specializes almost exclusively in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but that beautiful Goldilocks thing about Pinot Noir, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, it's too cold right up in Chablis in the north, and it's too warm to make really good quality in the Maconnais, but I would argue there's some good value. So you might not be getting the Grand and Premier Cruz, but you can still get some good Pinot there. But generally, what we see in Burgundy is right in that central point, we have the heartland. And uh, in particular, a place called Cote d'Or. D, well, it's like the coffee maker, I think, isn't it? D apostrophe O-R. So it's the, the golden slopes. Um, and that encompasses the Cote, Cote de Nuit and the Cote de Beaune, uh, which are the two most famous areas, particularly uh, the Cote de Nuit. And that is where you get those really, really famous areas. So things such as um, uh, you've got Gevrey Chambertin, you've got Vaux Romani. Uh, we are talking wines that I will never be able to afford to buy. Um, but that's not to say that all of Burgundy needs to be too expensive. It's just that uh, very confusing but some laws of inheritance and quite limited land where you can grow means that it's so expensive to produce wine in Burgundy. And those top, top sites along the valley of the river are the absolute best. And so you really do pay for the land as much as anything. Um, I'll just pop up now a map. 
to show you what we've been discussing here. So Shabli at the top and Shabli with only Chardonnay. Macanay at the bottom with a little bit of Pinot and then this real golden area, which is uh, where all of the best Pinot is produced. Now, this wine that we're tasting today, and you'll have to excuse me, is just hopefully you can see my cursor. It's just at the bottom of the Côte de Beaune, so right on the southern tip of where good quality uh, Pinot Noir is produced. And the reason I mention that is because we are talking about a warm area. Warmer Pinot tends, although not exclusively, but tends to create those thicker skins. And you can see it in the color. It's much, much darker than our first wine. It's, um, it's also had a few tips and tricks, I should say. So it's had the stems included in the wine. Um, and that can uh, do all sorts of things. But I think one thing you're going to get here is some really bright acidity that the stems bring and also potentially some flavours as well. Whilst you all have a sniff and a swirl for any wine buffs, this is the exact plot that it comes from that I'm just circling here on the map. Uh, so if you really are interested, uh, you can visit Marange, 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 Marange. Uh, and you can try the wines here and you can see these lovely rolling slopes of Burgundy. But let's taste along and I can hear what some of you have to say. Um, this wine, as I mentioned, was whole cluster. So you hopefully might get some more tannins as well in this that often people say come from including the stems of the grapes in the grape berries themselves. Um, it was actually fermented in yeast, uh, in yeast, sorry, it had its indigenous yeast fermentation in concrete tanks, but uh, was then moved to 24 months in oak barrel, only 25% of which was new, and of course being in France would have been French oak, so French oak doesn't tend to give vanilla in quite the same way, it would tend to give more of those clove and more earthy spices to it. So have a little taste. For me, much more red fruit. Uh, sorry, black fruit, the opposite. We had loads of red fruit in our first wine. This is much more black fruit. So cherries, um, uh, plummy notes. It does still have some of that red fruit as well, but definitely a more intense sort of black oomph. Um, I would also say that the wine has developed a little bit in bottle. Um, I gave a bit to my dad to try earlier and he said he found it quite earthy, particularly compared to the first wine. Um, that sort of mushroomy, um, if you go back to that original page I showed you, that cluster on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. So that sort of development, um, almost foresty, forest floor, like going for a lovely wet walk in autumn, that lovely kind of uh, autumnal ground smell after it's been raining. But it's certainly more concentrated as well. This is a wine where they will have left the grapes on a little bit longer so that they've got more fruit concentration, not at the expense of acidity, um, but certainly got a bit more power to them. Um, and that, that oak will have also helped. So you hopefully in this wine get a bit of everything. You get all three of those clusters. Um, and that's why I didn't feel like it was very fair to start with this wine because it's a real powerhouse of a wine. And particularly from having been on that lower sort of almost most southerly part of the Cote d'Or section of Burgundy. It's going to be one of the warmer areas. So I'm keen to know what you think of it. Do write in the chat um, and let me know. Uh, and we're going to move on to, we are going to move on to the third wine, but actually I'm going to do a very small detour um, because I want to quickly mention where else in France Burgundy is grown because I think if, uh, Burgundy, sorry, Pinot Noir is grown because I think if you do enjoy Pinot from France, you don't just have to buy from Burgundy. 
Um, it is expensive and we've talked about that. Yes, it's the longest lived, it's probably the best made, but there are pockets of real beauty as well if you like Pinot Noir and want to explore other parts of France. So a real whistle stop tour. Um, Champagne, although they don't make a red still wine out of it, or they do, but um, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's a bit astringent. It's too cold, really. Global warming may change that, but we'll see. Um, but there is actually more Pinot Noir grown in Champagne than there is in the whole of Burgundy. So just a fun fact for you. Um, the Jura would be one of my top recommendations. It's actually just over the mountains, or, or I should say in a different valley to Burgundy, but it's a really similar latitude. So you get very similar temperatures, great soils as well. Um, so if you are looking for a sort of Burgundy alternative, Jura is a great place, although they make wines in really small quantities. So um, quite challenging to find in the UK market, but Marcel Arbaia does a fantastic job. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, Alsace. So right up in the north on the uh, border with Germany, historically, probably not the finest, but actually um, really improving winemaking and a little bit of global warming is helping as well. And then lastly, the Languedoc and Limoux down in the south. Those are fab places to pick up affordable Pinot Noir. You'd say south, but Anna, you've told us it's too hot. Uh, no, they're grown on, well, I say mountains, but they're certainly grown at altitude. And because they're grown at altitude, they're lovely and cool. The grapes have time to relax in the cool evenings, even if they do get the sunshine in the day. Uh, they also tend to be really affordable. So um, look out for those as well. Um, I'll send around some recommendations over email after this session. If you're traveling around other parts of Europe, then I can recommend, highly recommend German Spätburgunder. Um, it is the same as Pinot Noir, it's the same grape, they just call it late berry, Spit Burgunder. Um, and it's the second most planted grape after Riesling in Germany, would you believe? And it's absolutely fabulous. Again, hard to get hold of, but delicious. Um, Italy as well, where they call it Pinot Nero, a great find. And again, pretty hard to find, but you're going to look for the northern parts of Italy, like Alto Adige. So that leaves us to quickly skip around the rest of the, uh, what we, we tend to call new world, but uh, emerging wine areas, uh, because a lot of Pinot Noir is grown at great prices around the world. Um, South Africa, you might not necessarily consider, but uh, there are parts of cool climate South Africa where there's great Pinot Noir being produced. Romania is a really good up and coming place as well. But probably the most famous that we're not covering today is Australia. And uh, there are parts of Australia I had a little map up, but I think in the interests of time, I'll just explain. It's basically the south part of Australia. And uh, it's really where the uh, cool ocean currents have the most influence. And the final one we're going to have is all about ocean currents as well. But you need those cool ocean breezes coming off the sea to chill out your Pinot Noir. And if you have that, and if you have that, then you, um, if you have that, then it means your Pinot will develop beautifully. It keeps the acid, but you also don't have the uh, sort of dropping off of fruit flavors that sometimes people describe. So my personal favorite is Mornington Peninsula, and I'll wax lyrical about that, but it's quite boutique-y. Um, but if you want some more affordable stuff, Yarra Valley is a really good place to look and Geelong as well. Um, but really, you're looking for if anybody ever writes cool climate on their website, that's a great sign because it means that the Pinot will be beautifully fresh and won't have gone into that sort of jammy, overripe flavour. But the final place we're going to stop on our whistle stop tour is uh, the USA. And the USA is uh, one of my favorite wine growing regions in the world, but I was actually pretty much a uh, USA Pinot novice until about, or certainly not an advocate, until about sort of seven or eight years ago. Um, and I was lucky enough to visit, and I actually went to Santa Barbara and some of those cooler climate regions, didn't make it up to Sonoma where this final wine is from. Um, but I have to say, the winemaking techniques that they're using in the US and the little pockets they've been able to find of cold climates are really impressive for Pinot. 
So the three uh, states, I should say, where Pinot is popular are California, that we're exploring today, Oregon, which is north of California. And for anyone who's a Pinot buff already, they'll know uh, most people in the world say that Oregon is the most like for like in terms of climate, soils, etc., to Burgundy in the world. And a lot of Burgundian producers have set up camp in Oregon. And then lastly, in New York, Finger Lakes too. But this particular wine is from Sonoma. And Sonoma is part of California where the most of the uh, Pinot Noir is grown. Um, it is really affordable, ridiculously affordable. Um, the difference I would say with the first two wines is this is incredibly sun, sunny climates, but there are these amazing fogs, and I'll show you uh, some, some footage or some certainly some images, but they come off the bay here. So just by San Francisco, where my cursor is, and they come off this bay and they almost act like a sort of, it's not too much rain. They basically create this cool microclimate um, around the San Pablo Bay that Pinot just absolutely loves. You'll notice the alcohol on this is slightly higher than the others, and that comes from the sun. But really, it's all about those cool fogs that chill the grape out and make sure that it can reach its optimum ripeness without falling off that cliff that we spoke about. So this wine in particular was de-stemmed, um, went straight into stainless steel for fermentation, um, also pumped twice a day to give more color and flavor. And you'll see this is almost a bit in between the two in terms of the color, but this went onto oak to age for seven months. However, 40% of it was new. And hopefully, fingers crossed, what you will get from this, and I'm just going to show you exactly where it is in this beautiful little mini area, but what you'll get from this gorgeous setting as you have a taste is that American oak. They've used, sorry, French oak, American oak, and Eastern European oak. And Hopefully you get some of those really lovely vanilla, clove, spices. It's got redder fruits. It's got richer fruits. It's a really, really generous wine. Um, quite um, barbecue friendly, I think is probably the word I'd use to describe it. Um, but it's certainly rich and unctuous. And it's a great wine to move yourself from sort of summer months into, uh, into the autumn with that with that rich fruit flavor combined with the vanilla spices those all remind me a little bit of uh should i say christmas um but you know what i mean those autumnal spices um i can see there's a few questions come in and i'm conscious we've sort of whistled through pinot as i said it's definitely an introduction rather than a deep dive i'm happy to hang on a little bit longer if people do have more questions um but I will quickly answer a few now. Um, Colin Harvey, why is it so much darker? Well, I mentioned the final wine was aged in oak. Sometimes that can have a little bit of an influence on the color, but actually probably it's that sunshine has made the skins um, a bit thicker, a bit richer. Obviously I spoke earlier about the ozone layer in New Zealand, but that wine was picked earlier. So the grapes had maybe not developed the full skin ripeness. Um, but this particular wine, the client has definitely been picked at full ripeness. You can taste the ripeness of the fruit in your mouth, I think. It really does taste completely different to wines one and two. We've almost gone on Pinot Noir through its sort of evolution of, of what climate does to Pinot Noir as much as anything else. Um, I'll just have a little quick look to see if anyone else has got any other questions coming through. Um, the Schweingen, oh, so the original tasting list, it's worth mentioning, we, we actually had some problems uh, getting stock of our Spätburgunder, but I cannot recommend it enough, Martin Vassmann. Um, so if you did manage to have a bottle, or I know some of you had older vintages you were planning on drinking, um, please, please do explore Spätburgunder as a um, very, very affordable and good alternative to, uh, to, well, it's not an alternative to Pinot Noir, but a German version of Pinot Noir. Um, any other questions coming in? Um, do, do, do. I think the Kumu, Kumu is great for the price, but doesn't get review, great reviews on the website. 
and I like this comment, Peter, a lot. Perhaps wines like Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo are misunderstood by many. Um, funnily enough, we had a bit of a debate about including this wine, actually. It has had poor reviews on the website. Um, I think when you're buying Pinot Noir, there has to be an element of expectation and whether you're going to meet those expectations. Now, a £10 Pinot Noir is not going to have oak, for example. Oak is expensive. Um, it won't have been aged for a long time in somebody's cellar. And when I say somebody, I mean a producer's cellar, because time is money. So whilst Burgundy is stratospheric and certainly Grand Cruz and Premier Cruz are, if you leave that aside, Buying Pinot Noir, there is an element of price to it because you can do something with it, but also the the, pla the best places in the world that it's grown, and Oregon really does spring to mind, um, they are expensive to produce wines there. And the land is at such a, a sort of, in such high demand that that drives prices up as well. So I suspect, Peter, to exactly your point, if you're going into the Kumi wine thinking that you're getting an affordable Burgundy for £10, that's not what this is. Um, and like you say, with wines like Nebbiolo, perhaps a little bit of a lack of understanding about what to expect in the glass, um, which is why I only really wanted to include one Burgundy in this, because as much as Burgundy, we could have done, we could do 70 wines from Burgundy and they'd all taste completely different. Um, it's really nice to just see exactly what Pinot Noir can do in all its different guises. And quite frankly, the Kumu River wine is a fresh, fruity, almost even spritzy um, New World Pinot Noir. And, and not all New World Pinot Noirs are like that, but this particular one is. And uh, if you went into it thinking you were going to be able to have it with roast game and et cetera, then it's not built for that. It's, it's uh, not that style of wine. Um, where isn't Pinot not Noir grown where it should be? Good question, John. And I'm going to actually tee that up with Colin Harvey's question about saying something quickly on UK Pinot Noir. Uh, because um, historically, the UK has been too cold. Um, and I remember trying a UK Pinot Noir from a producer I won't name, but um, about 10 years ago. And I was sent it uh, when I, in my more wine journal days. And um, it was fine but it was about three times the price of the Kumu and didn't taste a million miles off the Kumu. Um, it was pleasant, but the, the, it didn't have enough structure to be sort of considered in the world's finest wines. I have recently tasted Pinot Noir from the UK and it has arrived at some of the world's finest Pinot Noirs. Um, particularly around Essex, it's doing really well. It's uh, the sunniest and the least rainfall of the wine growing areas, uh, not the warmest, but the sunniest with the least rain. Um, and as you now know, Pinot Noir doesn't need too much heat. It just needs enough. It's got the Goldilocks complex. Um, and with global warming and climate change, Essex has reached enough, but a great amount of sunshine and uh, not too much rain. So watch this space. Matthew Horsley, our buyer for England, has started buying still English Pinot Noir, which I am delighted about. Um, but I think the more that people get used to it, the more producers start experimenting. Um, then, yes, Essex Pinot Noir, would you believe it, is probably the place, the one to watch. You didn't expect me to say that in the Pinot Noir webinar, did you? <laughs> Essex is the up and coming uh, wine region of the world. Um, but certainly that would be my, that would genuinely be my top recommendation. Um, the other place I think probably they don't do it enough justice is... Um, some of the Penedes regions in Spain, they grow Pinot Noir to blend into their cava. And there are very few still red Pinot Noirs, and quite rightly so, because they want to use indigenous varieties. Um, but if they're blending it into the cava at such good quality, I would be interested, and it's interested rather than aware, I'd be really interested to know if there were some good still ones that I've perhaps not discovered. And if there are, then I think... Um, the Spanish are probably keeping them to themselves. Um, you, again, it's that classic, you think it's too hot, but it's grown at altitude, sort of, you know, a few hundred metres above sea level. And if it's going into Carva, uh, as it does a good champagne, then quite frankly, I think we need to see some, some fruits of that labour in the still wine world. So those are my two answers. Essex and the Penedes around uh, Barcelona and Spain. 
Lovely. I'm conscious I have overrun, but I was always going to. There was no way I was going to pack Pinot Noir into 45 minutes. Even an introduction, it was just going to be absolute chaos with my arguably my favourite red grape. Um, I will give you a couple of recommendations if you like Pinot Noir and you want to explore other grape varieties like Pinot Noir, because I think that's always nice to, to explore things around what you've enjoyed. Um, I would say Nebbiolo is one, um, and Nebbiolo uh, can be made in a variety of styles. Again, so there's, it's not one size fits all. Don't try one Nebbiolo and decide you don't like it. But a, a lighter style of Nebbiolo certainly has that sort of aromatic quality that a Pinot Noir has. Um, I would also recommend Greek Chino Mavro. I'll send it in an email because I'm not going to spell it now. My dyslexia will get the better of me. Um, the Greek Chino Mavro, again, very aromatic, uh, lots of similarities, something quite herbal, lots of red fruits, some black fruits. So that's very similar. Um, and then my last pump would actually be for lighter styles of Grenache. Uh, and the reason I say that is that Grenache side by side to Pinot Noir, there's only really one notable exception if you're making your Grenache uh, in a less sort of, um, in a slightly cooler climate Grenache and not too much skin contact. So not so much of those slightly thicker skins um, on uh, in with the juice. The only real difference between Grenache and Pinot when you're tasting them side by side when it's in that style is the alcohol. So um, Grenache can be a bit, a bit more boozy, but actually we've just seen a Pinot Noir, I think it's 14 and a half percent um, from, yeah, 14 and a half from the US. So Pinot can get there, um, but certainly uh, light styles of Grenache are not to be sniffed at if you're a Pinot Noir fan, because there's there's plenty, plenty of flavour similarities there. Um, and Tim Jones, how about Loire Reds for a lighter style? Um, yes to Loire Reds, but there are, uh, they do grow Pinot Noir in the Loire. Uh, it just tends to be a little more expensive than perhaps um, other red grapes in the Loire. So you can buy a very, very good value Cabernet Franc. Um, perhaps less known is that Red Sancerre is actually Pinot Noir. Um, and you can get absolutely cracking Pinot Noir in the Loire. Um, and we do sell it sometimes. So it is worth checking out. Um, again, the Loire is slightly benefiting from the climate change thing because it's quite northerly. Uh, historically, they've been a little bit greener, a bit more austere, a bit more astringent. And they're certainly becoming a bit more um, fruit forward, should we say. So, yes, I would agree. Tim Jones, watch this space for Loire Reds, um, in particular from, from the great variety Pinot. Lovely. Right. I've really overrun now, but uh, I, I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, apologies for our technical issues at the beginning. I think they've unfortunately continued because I know that a lot of members couldn't get online to join us live. But hopefully they'll have watched on our YouTube channel or on the recording. Um, for those of you who are new to our events, we have loads and loads online with less technical difficulties, um, but we have plenty of events online, including the next of these sessions. So I'm going to run through some great varieties first, just a handful to get us uh, to get us going. And then we're going to start looking at some regions and then we're going to deep dive into some French appellations, uh, maybe a bit of winemaking in the future. Uh, and if you did like, uh, if you do like the idea of Pinot, then watch this space because next year we're going to be introducing some things uh, on things like stem inclusion. And um, hopefully, I'm trying to convince Toby to to do something in the next couple of months before Christmas on um, Burgundy in particular, red Burgundy, but also some white. Uh, so do watch this space. Please do keep looking at the website. Um, and yes, all of our information is there. And I'm lucky enough to have three bottles of Pinot Noir to, to finish off. But I, I uh, like I said, I won't be indulging too much as an early start for the syrup sorting. Uh, but it was lovely to have you all members, as always. Uh, hope to see you soon. And apologies if you did struggle to get on earlier. We, uh, we will definitely fix it for the next session. So cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> Thank you, Anna. Most enjoyable.